and hard of hearing students. A month and a half ago, the school inaugurated its first deaf female president. So joining me to discuss the legacy and the future of the university is Roberta Cordano. She is the president of Gallaudet University. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Kojo. It's just lovely to be here with you. You can follow today's conversation in a number of ways. For those who are hard of hearing or deaf, we have live captioning and a live video stream on our website, kojoshow.org. You can call us at 800-433-8850. Send an email to kojo at wamu.org or send us a tweet. At Kojo Show, you can post a question or comment on our Facebook page or on our website, kojoshow.org. President Cardano is communicating using American Sign Language. An interpreter will translate her comments into English for listeners. You can call again, call right now, 800-433-8850. As I mentioned a moment ago, you are the first woman to serve as Gallaudet's president, who is also deaf. What does it mean to you to take on that role? Well, if I may first begin with, uh, that's a perfect question, actually, as we recognize you and your leadership making this interview accessible to the deaf community. And with that, You know, we always look for opportunities to be engaged and connected to the radio in some capacity and being up to date with what happens in these kinds of settings and you're making it accessible is much appreciated. And thank you for your commitment for that. And it's also important for my leadership at Gallaudet University as well. As a leader, it's important to make sure that our community has opportunities to learn and to grow and not just that, but to be curious and to acquire knowledge in a number of different ways as it's presented to us in the world. You inherit this job from T. Allen Hurwitz, who served as president from 2010 to 2015. What changes can the school and the surrounding community expect to come with the change in leadership? Well, you know, I think the previous president, President Hurwitz, and the Board of Trustees worked very hard over the last six years to really lay the foundation. And that foundation is for us to engage in a transformation, and we expect that transformation to transpire over the next 10 years, looking to strengthen our core areas, and in addition to that, looking including areas such as our science, our branding, branding, our identities, as well as our sciences and liberal arts education that we provide at this university. So we're now building on that important work and that important foundation as we prepare our students for the 21st century. Although you were inaugurated at the end of September, you've actually been serving as president since January. So congratulations on almost a year on the job. What has surprised you about leading Gallaudet so far? Hmm, that's a great question. You know, I think What I would say to that, and this is for me personally, is just the joy of the experience of working with students and really letting the students do the leading and the learning and understanding what it means to be more curious and also understanding the complexities of our culture and with that the diversity and the diverse community that exists at Gallaudet. In case you're just joining us, our guest is Roberta Cordano. She is the president of Gallaudet University. She's communicating using American Sign Language. An interpreter will be translating her comments into English for listeners. You can still join the conversation by calling 800-433-8850, sending us email to kojo at wamu.org, a tweet at Kojo Show, or you can go to our website, kojoshow.org, watch the live video stream of the broadcast, ask a question, or make a comment there. The neighborhood around Gallaudet University has changed dramatically in the past few years, perhaps most notably Union Market, a dining destination for people all across the city opened up. What does this changing neighborhood mean for the Gallaudet community? You know, really there are two opportunities that I see it for Gallaudet and the community as we go forward. The first opportunity is for Gallaudet to experience the culture and the language that we do on our community and allow that to flow out into our community and our neighborhood. And of course, because of Union Market, our students are employed there quite often and our staff will go over to Union Market for shopping and work there. and. The sign language in our community is much more visible now so more than ever. 
And so with that, the D.C. community is now beginning to see us uh, more openly. The more awareness is built there. We want to continue with the development of what's happening, not just on 6th Street, but all around the neighborhood surrounding Gallaudet, which leads to the second point, and that is that Gallaudet is now working very hard under my leadership to understand what it means to be a citizen of the neighborhood. And with that, we're part of the future of Washington, D.C. We see ourselves that way. We're a jewel of the Washington, D.C. And we need to understand how we can preserve the ability for, you know, people in the middle class to be able to continue to live and work and become active citizens in Washington, D.C. in that area. And with that, we want to be careful not to have, you know, too much gentrification so that universities such as Gallaudet and Howard University and even American University here can still have employees, staff, and faculty, as well as students who can live nearby, nearby to our campuses, for the next 20 to 50 years. What vision do you have for the neighborhood and for Gallaudet's role in it for the next 20 years or so? Well, we are already working with the city on the development of the 6th Street area. And the city has made it very clear that their values are such that they really support the notion of affordable housing, and that's part of the development at 6th Street. At the same time, I'm beginning conversations in the very early stages now, having conversations with the neighborhood that surrounds our university, including Trinidad and Ivy City, and then even looking to other neighborhoods on 8th Street in Florida and looking to see if there's ways that we can look for models that we can improve the ability for the people to stay within the neighborhood community and continue to invest in the middle class. And this is a topic of interest for me as president and as well as for our community. And I think we'll continue to really deepen those conversations as time goes on related to this topic because it is important for us as well as the folks in D.C. I'd like to talk in some more detail about the development. Gallaudet is partnering with development from JBG in a 1.2 million square foot development project. Can you give us a preview of what to expect there? Oh, uh, well, actually, JBG and Gallaudet, from the very, very beginning, understood that this was a unique partnership an opportunity for us to really have the world, the world meet Gallaudet at this corridor along 6th Street, and for Gallaudet to meet the world as well. And so for us not to just go out through this corridor, but to have the other happen as well. So if you look at what's happened up to date, it gives you some insight into what the potential of things that lie ahead. And one example is that we've been partnering with the city as well as Pigmental Studios in order to bring animation, animation studios here to Washington, D.C., and particularly to Gallaudet's campus. This is a national partnership with animation, which of course is a visual form of art, and Gallaudet University being a campus that values visual media and visual experience. And the students, of course, tie in very naturally with this kind of work. So we really want to transform this corridor, and cor Pigmental is just one example of what we're going to see over time. This project will be the first to apply Gallaudet's deaf space design guidelines. Can you explain That's what right. those are for us? Well, I'm so glad you brought that up. You know, this was part of our agreement with JBG in that we wanted to develop both sides of 6th Street to reflect deaf space principles, but really to understand what that means for just the common listener. Perhaps I should go back and talk about the emerging field called human-centered design. Mm -hmm. And with human-centered design, what it does is it really focuses on the user experience in any setting, in any space. And for deaf space, we've already begun to identify what makes space so very unique and friendly, comfortable, and welcoming for people who are deaf who have experienced some kind of hearing loss. And so now, when you do deaf space design, it actually becomes much more welcoming for an, an everyone who enters that environment, not just for people who are experiencing hearing losses or those people who are more visual as opposed to experience the world through an auditory sense. So part of this transition is that this project will in fact launch Gallaudet as an epicenter, an epicenter for human-centered design. 
and research and teaching and learning, of course, over time will continue along this area, beginning with the work that we've done in the area of deaf space. On to the telephones now. Here is Muhammad in Washington, D.C. Muhammad, you are on the air. Go ahead, please. Yes, hi, Kojo. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm in, in the Ivy City area, which is right behind the Gallaudet University. I've had businesses, I've had a grocery store, and we never really seen the students of Gallaudet shop or, you know, walk around. And recently, with all the changes, thanks to the developments that took place in Union Market, um, next warehouse we actually seeing them come out and shop and they're looking for places to rent so the area has improved i would say a thousand percent and uh, i just want to thank everybody that participated in improving our neighborhood and allowing those students not to be living in a kind of jail that's how they live they lived inside the fence and they couldn't come out at night, and they couldn't go uh, walking around. But now you see them jogging. Uh, you see them coming to the mosque in the neighborhood. They see them coming to the churches and shopping everywhere in the Ivy City area. So, again, I just want to thank the government. Uh, Douglas Jamal has done beautiful work on uh, improving the Hecht warehouse and bringing it up. And uh, Union Market is an ideal, beautiful location and that's all I had to say. Mohammed, thank you very much for your call, and you allow me to raise an issue here that President Cardano touched on briefly before. Do you find that the businesses that surround Gallaudet are welcome to deaf customers? Well, there's two things. I'm curious if Mohammed is still on the line. Is yes, he? Yes, Mohammed is very much there. And what's the name of his business, the grocery store he mentioned? Mohammed, what's the name I of your business? Freshway, Delhi Market. Freshway Deli Market. That's great. That's awesome. Very nice to know the name of the store. I'll make it a point to check it out and spread the word <laughs> at Gallaudet all about your store. So thanks for that. I'll make a personal appearance sometime soon. I can assure you of that. But I did want to say in addition, you know, one thing I wanted to capture as it relates to your question and also his comment about the students being sort of in a jail on campus. You know, I have a very different view of Gallaudet. And this development that's happening around Gallaudet is actually a wonderful opportunity in a way that Mohammed has just described. Because we now have a community that's vibrant, that's safe, and that's welcoming. So our students can actually go out into this community. And that's not always been the history of this neighborhood for our students. And at the same time, it's interesting because I've had experienced some stories from the neighborhood noticing when they see our students and staff out on the streets using sign language and immediately identifying that they're from Gallaudet. And our experiences of crime actually have been diminished because of their understanding of who we are as neighbors and really them protecting our students and our community. So we've always appreciated that from the neighboring community. But second, I wanted to say that Gallaudet, as you've mentioned, was the first university in the world of its kind and continues to be the only university of its kind in the world. I mean, it's the first time that a government has ever recognized the importance of teaching through American Sign Language. And Gallaudet has respected American Sign Language as a way of learning and a way of being in the world for 152 years. But even 152 years later, there is no other country or government that has recognized or created a space for the language of higher education to be a sign language anywhere in the world. And so we have a double obligation here. We want to be a citizen of our neighborhood and to create an understanding, as Mohammed has displayed here and other people, that they can employ deaf people, they can welcome and be more inclusive of our students. Hiring our students and our alumni is always a great goal. And us teaching and learning ASL and them learning that on their own is also a quality. But at the same time, we have a duty and an obligation to protect the sanctity of this language and the culture on Gallaudet's campus. And, you know, until we have more places like Gallaudet emerging, this is sacred ground for us, sacred ground for our community and our language. And so we 
have to understand the impact of this development that's happening all around our campus that it might potentially have on our campus. And I have a deep appreciation of the conversation that people have engaged in since I arrived. And they've really helped us wrestle with this question of how to make sure that we're preserving our language and our culture throughout this, you know, enormous development that's happening all around Gallaudet. What advice do you have for our region's business owners who want to make sure that deaf and hard of hearing customers feel welcome? Well, I would give the same advice to them as I give to our students and our faculty and staff at Gallaudet. The number one rule in order to improve is to be curious about other people. You know, when students come into the establishments and shoppers come in and you recognize that they're deaf, just ask, you know, what could I do to make this a more pleasant shopping experience for you? How can I engage and connect with you? I mean, you can use your iPhone and type in messages, use the keyboard to communicate back and forth with someone. You don't necessarily have to learn sign language, but the most important thing is to connect. But first, that stems from curiosity. When you're curious, it's amazing how much you can learn and how much can happen between between two people, even when they speak different languages and have different cultures. We're going to have to take a short break, but we'll be right back. Our guest is Roberta Cordano. She is the president of Gallaudet University. You can join the conversation by calling 800-433-8850. You can follow today's conversation in a number of ways. For those who are hard of hearing or deaf, we have live captioning and a live video stream at our website, kojoshow.org. I'm Kojo Nandi. Welcome back. Our guest is Roberta Cordano. She is the president of Gallaudet University. President Cordano is communicating using American Sign Language. An interpreter will, is translating her comments into English for listeners. But you can join the conversation by calling 800-433-8850. Watch the live video stream at our website, kojoshow.org. Ask a question or make a comment there. Send us a tweet at kojoshow or email to kojo at wamu.org. Back to the phones. Here now is Sarah in Washington, D.C. Sarah, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi. I um, was listening to the show, and I... Um, I was just taken a little bit aback by President Cordano's comment of middle class in the neighborhood. Yes. And I just, um, historically, Trinidad and Ivy City have not been middle class neighborhoods. And what is her thinking about the people that are being displaced for this to become a middle class neighborhood? And also, as I was on hold, I heard her talking about the students. The previous caller said something about it being like jail. Well, the students have not always been the greatest neighbors. I mean, parties, crime that have really kind of made me not want them in my neighborhood. So I'm just a little bit curious about what her thinking is on that. We have some town and gown issues here. <laughs> Go ahead, please, President Cardano. 
conversation. Sure. You know, I appreciate this question very much. It's always helpful to clarify. Um, right. I would agree with you that not all people in the neighborhood are middle class. And in fact, many are working class citizens um, living in the neighborhood around us. And to be very honest, while our obligation is certainly to ensure that people from low-income, working-class, middle-class individuals can all stay in the neighborhood. Really, I'm looking at the comprehensive community development that needs to happen. We know that when you have a mixture of all different classes living in a neighborhood together, the neighborhood thrives. And affordable housing and the requirements with the city actually help low-income and many working-class people but the challenge is often that the working class individuals and above those who are in the middle class can't afford to be in the neighborhood. But of course, the wealthier class can. And so when we look at policies in the city, there are many policies that protect the low income and the working class, but not the middle classes. And so we have a strong, when you have a strong middle class, then that actually can help to stabilize the neighborhood. And now, you know, I mentioned a couple things, and one of those is about the assumption that there are not middle class living in the neighborhood. And many Gallaudet staff and faculty actually do live in the neighborhood around Gallaudet, and they are, as I say, middle class. And, you know, we have people who are living there now. I'm sure that there are others as well. And they believe in the neighborhood and they want to have access to the neighborhood. We have to be careful not to overgeneralize who lives in the community around us. Secondly, I wanted to say if you talk about that sense of jail and the experience of the students, you know, I have to admit my view of the students is that they, they will behave uh, within their community based on how the adults interact with them. And so I think too often we form opinions and views of the students as being, you know, partiers and that kind of thing. But, you know, we don't get involved in coaching and teaching them and connecting with them and building relationships with them. My experience has been when I connect with them and talk with them and really build relationships with them, I do see change. Very often they're looking for people to engage with them. And so my belief has been, and always is, is that we need to do a better job with our young people at really connecting with them, coaching them, giving them ideas about how to lead as members of our community, and not just being able to stay in that role of being, you know, an independent person who can behave and not understand the impact that they have on our community. I'm asking our students at Gallaudet to get engaged and be engaged citizens of the world, not just the campus, but also the neighborhood and of course in this city in particular too. A lot of people who have lived in this region for a long time have probably never set foot on Gallaudet's campus. How would mm -hmm. you invite Washingtonians, hearing or not, to interact or to get involved with the university? Well, a couple of things here. I was actually at a meeting, at a Trinidad community meeting it was, and I think we need to check the assumption that people have not been on campus because actually what happened is that they challenged me at this meeting. They said, you know, there used to be camps on our campus for their children, both deaf children and hearing children. And these were bilingual camps that we made available using both ASL and English within the camp environment. And, and in a little bit, I would like to talk about the concept that we're using for bilingual, but I did want to respond to the question. I'll get back to the notion of bilingual in a moment. But nonetheless, the community used to feel that they were engaged with us. But at some point, Gallaudet had a hard time having the right financial model to sustain those camps. And so we stopped offering them within the last 10 years. And now I'm actually beginning to look at how we might be able to use this very unique period of time that we're in right now and try to engage with the community to understand the opportunities for bilingual learning that can happen from birth all the way through end of life. And so, you know, with that effort, I think we can find more opportunities for the community to engage with Gallaudet again. You know, we're actually now looking and reviewing at some projects for 6th Street that will hopefully provide more opportunities to families and their children and adults to engage with Gallaudet and to learn about how both languages um, can function together, uh, both American Sign Language and English, and how both languages can enrich all of our lives in multiple ways. 
Back to the telephones again. Here is Sunyata in Northwest Washington. Sunyata, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon, Kojo, and thanks for having this show. I really appreciate the subject matter today. I had a question, which is um, I'm a business owner, and I own a cafe in Washington, D.C., here on 7th Street. We see a lot of people who come in who um, we could benefit from being able to communicate with them via sign language. Is it something that the university is willing to do to send folks out for some, just some basic training? Uh, my staff would love to learn more. Thank you very much. Oh, wow, that is a wonderful question. Yeah, and it starts in a place that I love, which is the place of being curious, curiosity. First, we're actually now working on what's called ASL Connect, which is an online ASL learning platform. We already have online ASL 1 and ASL 2 classes that are accessible for people to use, but I also have to confess that we have many, many students who are studying to become ASL teachers and who would appreciate the opportunity to be asked to come and provide tutoring and to be paid to teach a class. It's a good way to get internship experience for the students. To connect with our American Sign Language and Deaf Studies Department is the great way to start. And just to begin there to ask for students who might be willing to come to your establishment. They could, you know, shape an internship and a teaching experience for the students so that they could benefit from their learning at Gallaudet, as you can benefit from them as well. But thank you for that question. We got um, a post on Facebook from John, who's, who writes, Hearing students make up only 5% of the student population and can be instrumental in connecting the deaf or hard of hearing population to those who are hearing. Beyond American Sign Language interpretation, how do you leverage those hearing students to bridge divides between deaf and hearing communities to eliminate stereotypes? Well, I think it's an interesting question, especially the way it was framed, and perhaps I could reframe it here and think how hearing students can leverage their experience with us in order to be a different kind of ambassador to the world. And I can give you one very good example of how an experience at Gallaudet transformed just one single person. I was actually at the Harvard seminar for new presidents this past July. And one of the interpreters who was there is a hearing female. She got her BA degree, her MA degree at Gallaudet University in the field of interpreting. And I asked her about her experience while at Gallaudet. She talked about how profound that experience was for her, entering an environment that was a completely different for her, completely different for her with a completely different language. She said it was a true immersion experience. You go to another country, you can learn a different language through that immersion experience. And she described her experience at Gallaudet as being similar, a deep transforming experience for her that led then her to go on to become a stronger interpreter, a stronger ambassador, and to be able to explain that this culture and language, you know, hearing loss is not, of course, something to be fixed, but there's a language that needs to be respected and appreciated and understanding the complexities around the translation process. She can do that so much better having had the experience of that language immersion at Gallaudet. So one of the benefits of that very rich language environment for those hearing students who come into this environment is that they leave transformed individuals and their view of deaf people are greatly transformed. Now for us at Gallaudet, we not only just have hearing students who come to learn American Sign Language, but we have more and more students. In fact, almost 15% of our students are coming to Gallaudet not knowing any ASL. They may be deaf or hard of hearing or deaf blind. That number used to be around the 5% mark, but now we're almost up to 15% of our student body who have never been exposed to American Sign Language growing up or perhaps had some exposure through some interpreting experiences, but truly never embodied the language. And so, you know, they realize when it's time for them to go to college, they come to an understanding of what it is that they want. The experience that I've had working with these students who come in under those circumstances, it's just amazing. Their identity and understanding of who they are after the Gallaudet experience truly deepens that in a way that they never had before coming out to Gallaudet. And they are becoming future leaders and change makers at Gallaudet University. And that's a history of Gallaudet. Whether you come to 
to Gallaudet not knowing sign language throughout your childhood or you come to Gallaudet knowing sign language, this culture truly creates leaders, change makers, and future innovators for the, the future. People who come with no experience of hearing loss, you know, that, that can have changes in our society, just like captioning, as you're doing here on your show. The whole notion of the technology and innovation behind captioning and figuring out how to translate each English word onto the screen actually was done by a Gallaudet alumni. So we are behind almost every major innovation in our society as it relates to providing access through visual means. Our guest is Roberto Cordana. Roberta Cordana. She's the president of Gallaudet University. You can follow today's conversation in a number of ways. If you happen to be hard of hearing or deaf, we have live captioning and a live video stream on our website, kojoshow.org. While you are the first president who is both deaf and female, Gallaudet did briefly have another woman in the role. A hearing woman was appointed by the board in the year 1988. As I recall, that was my introduction to a preliminary understanding of deaf culture because Mm. for those who are not familiar with what happened next, can you share the story? Yes, I sure can. In fact, it's a very powerful story uh, related to what happened and a wonderful, powerful time for you, Kojo, to have been introduced to Gallaudet. What happened at that time? And up until that point in time, I believe it had been about 124 years of Gallaudet's existence that there had never been a deaf president of the university. And at that time, when they were going through the selection process, there were some deaf finalists in the pool. But the board actually picked a hearing person, Elizabeth Zinzer, to become president, and what happened after that? This was a moment in history that truly it was not about the individuals involved, President Zinzer herself, but it was more about civil rights and the recognition of deaf people and deaf people needing to have the right and the opportunity to lead a university. And just a university that prided itself on being a university that teaches using American Sign Language and culture and building leaders of the future, that a leader of the university couldn't be deaf. How can we model leadership throughout the world for all deaf people if we don't do that here at Gallaudet? And it had to happen at Gallaudet. That was a civil rights protest. It was not about the people involved. And I know from my conversations with people, I mean, even, uh, you know, Elizabeth Zinzer, I think she even understands that she was part of a historical moment. And that the Board of Trustees also learned some very important lessons themselves. Lessons about how leadership and really claiming that leadership and understanding that our community after that will never be the same. And it was around that time the Americans with Disabilities Act was also passed. And so we were really part of a very historic era within the disability movement when we were claiming our civil rights as people with disabilities. And Gallaudet happened to have a national platform to really be able to demonstrate, demonstrate civil rights and opportunities for leadership and decision making and, you know, culture and language building that came with it as well. If you happen to be watching our live video stream at kojoshow.org, you can see just how passionate President Cordano is about this issue. Both your parents are Gallaudet alumni, but you did not yourself attend the school as a student. Tell us about your experience of education as a deaf person and how it shapes your approach to running the school. Yeah, you remember a little while ago I talked about the sign that I used to represent bilingual and how I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. You know, I'm a founder of two charter schools for deaf, hard of hearing, and deafblind children in Minnesota. And the focus of these schools was truly to teach where it's not an either or as it pertains to the two languages, but rather an and scenario, meaning English and ASL were respected equally in the education and learning processes. And my parents, my parents, graduated from Gallaudet fully appreciating the value of both languages. And their children, all of us learned ASL, and we also learned English through its written form and through reading. And my parents forced us to read. They didn't force us, but they made reading pleasurable for us. We read all the time. There were reading materials available everywhere around the house. And so picking up English was natural for me. ASL, of course, was my first language. But we held deeply both languages within our home. So when I got older, 
You know, I realized and, you know, of course, through talking with my mother and both of my parents, in fact, felt that the view of Gallaudet as an institution that teaches through American Sign Language was really not very valued in higher education. There was a lack of openness to the idea that people could learn through sign language and that it, they could actually become high performers in other sectors and other settings and other graduate schools. And so what we saw at that time were very, very few Gallaudet grads who would go in and be, you know, advanced into law schools. And so the numbers, of course, really represented the numbers game that said if you want to go to become an attorney, Gallaudet was not the place to go, you know, and we understood that. We were smart enough in that way. So when I was considering it, my mother said, can you try to go another college, a college that has a, a large number of students who go on to graduate school, a respected school, where I would be able to do well and be successful in this career. And so I picked another college at that time. Beloit was the name of the college. The classes were small. The other students would share their notes with me so that I could keep up. And to make a long story short, I went to law school. I had to fight for interpreters to have access for me there. I got through very well, of course, in the end, but I went on to become, from what I understood, the 17th deaf person to become an attorney. Now, let me connect this back to Gallaudet and the protest that you mentioned just a few moments ago. After that protest, the world suddenly woke up and said, you know what, these people are smart. These students have civil rights. They led a beautiful protest. They got the change that they wanted to see. They had purpose. They executed on that purpose that they wanted very successfully, they got the first deaf president, Dr. I. King Jordan. And so with that, after that point in time, and by the way, that protest happened while I was in law school. So shortly after that, there are now over 350 deaf attorneys in the United States today. And of course, many of them have graduated from Gallaudet. And what's changed? Not Gallaudet. It's the world their attitude and their view of the students who graduate from Gallaudet. But I was caught in that period of time in history that fell between. And the second thing that helped me actually lead to the founding of two charter schools in Minnesota was really helping to be involved in those charter schools came from the fact that I realized being part of the Minnesota community, that they offered a dream to these students that I had never been given. And the dream that they were offered was the dream to have this be such a case that every deaf children could learn two languages, both ASL and English. And hence the sign that I'm using shows this notion of being equal and language. Really what it means is there's more than one language. And the way that American Sign Language expresses it, of course, in its full complexity makes it difficult to actually produce the same rendering in English. It would require more of a paragraph to do so. But the sign connotes this notion of equal respect to both language and deference being given. So the idea of having dual languages is one that I also sign bilingual that also shows the notion of equivalence and equity given to both language. In the case of this charter school and Gallaudet, we teach both ASL and English is reinforced through its written form, its printed form. And for those people who can talk, spoken English, of course, is there. The important thing is, is that it's not an either or scenario. It's more of an and scenario is the way I, I define it. And that's a future we all can look forward to. For those of you who were not around in 1980, you should know that the students at Gallaudet had four demands. One, that Elizabeth Simpson must resign and a deaf person selected president. Two, Jane Spillman must step down as chairperson of the board of Th trustees. Three, deaf people must constitute a 51% majority on the board. And four, there would be no reprisals against any student or employee involved in the protest. All four demands were met. And the world got to know I. King Jordan. We're going to take a short break. When I come back, we'll continue this conversation with Roberta Cordano. She is the president of Gallaudet University, but you can still call 800-433-8850. Send email to kojo at wamu.org or watch the live video stream at our website, kojoshow.org, and ask a question or make a comment there. I'm Kojo Nand.
Welcome back. Our guest is Roberta Cordano. She is the president of Gallaudet University. We're taking your calls at 800-433-8850. President Cordano is communicating using American Sign Languages. An interpreter is translating her comments into English for listeners. You can watch the live video stream at our website, kojoshow.org. Send email to kojowamu.org. Give us a call, 800-433-8850. Here is Mark in Washington, D.C. Mark, you're on the air. Go ahead, please. Hi, Kojo. Thanks so much for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, I am the father of a daughter who's nine months old, who was born uh, profoundly deaf in both ears. Uh, we made the decision to get her uh, implanted with cochlear implants, which we actually just had activated. Uh, so we've used Gallaudet, some of their services, their audiology department, the Clare Center. They've been fantastic. So I just want to say thank you, first of all, to the president for making those services available to the public. You folks over there have been really great. But... My question kind of revolves around um, we, we want to develop our daughter's ability to hear and her spoken language, but we also want to embrace um, her deafness and the culture of her being deaf and that, that, that entire culture. And, and just kind of some talk about maybe the, the role of Gallaudet in technology moving forward uh, with cochlear implants, plus how parents can ensure that we, uh, you know, parents in, in my situation can, can ensure that we allow our daughters and sons to grow up kind of in both worlds and embracing everything at the same time. So uh, just like to hear a comment on that. Well, thank you for that question. And also thank you for your feedback about the services at Gallaudet. I'm sure the people there are beaming right now, getting this very positive feedback. So thank you for sharing that. It always means a lot to our staff and faculty at Gallaudet. But, but secondly, you know, I have to commend you as a parent. You know, commend you just for seeing the complexity within your own child and in your family life. You know, what's so challenging for many families is that when you have a child who's deaf, it's really hard to understand even how to move forward. And healthcare's primary focus and, you know, the tools that they're given that are covered by insurance as parents are all remedial as it relates to, you know, recovering or improving the child's hearing functioning. And, you know, the technology like the cochlear implants and hearing aids, they are just incredible ways to access spoken language, no doubt. And, you know, what it doesn't recognize is, you know, actually I've been a hearing aid user. People I know, of course, use cochlear implants and they still run on batteries and you can't wear them 24-7. When you're not using these devices, you can't hear. And so how can you communicate when you cannot hear in those instances? Well, sign language is a vehicle through which you can communicate at all times, whether the technology is on or off. And... You know, I think that's the complexity that people often don't see. And now there's research that's happening at Gallaudet and has been for the last 10 years that has finally shown that the science is catching up to what we have known through our wisdom and experience as a community, which is that knowing both languages leads the brain to be able to thrive. And a bilingual brain actually leads for a person's ability to increase their perception, widening that perception. It increases the complexity of the brain's ability to function as it relates to do computations and computers and arts. And we also know that it has a long-term positive impact on the development of a person's brain as it relates to their ability to learn and brain development over a lifetime as a result of being bilingual. So this parent is a perfect example of a parent who's providing their child with all of the tools, not just one set of tools, but the challenge for many parents and families is that access to resources can be very difficult. And in healthcare, what's covered is only the technology and the technological interventions like cochlear implants. I mean, you cannot get language intervention and brain development that comes with that. And not just that, you know, healthcare intervention through insurances, they don't cover that. So families are often left with only the ability to get the technology, but not the ability to get language intervention, which is actually, but if I could back up, which is actually has everything to do with the brain's need for development and exposure and stimulation. But that's not covered, of course, by insurances, 
nor is it really provided by through any policy at the federal or state level. And so parents make do as best they can, and we do have mentoring programs that nonprofits are doing, language mentoring. I know in Minnesota they have some, as do they in many other places in the country programs that provided language pref mentoring, but they're nonprofit, and it's not guaranteed for every family that has a deaf child. So until that changes, we won't see that interface that could happen between healthcare and language development. You know, they're really, it's critical to brain development, it is. And so both need to be tools that all parents have access to. And right now, that's not the case. But I do commend the parent who's just called for seeing the whole child and also recognizing the big change this has on their family. And, you know, families need to begin to understand that there are different experiences that happen in that child's life as opposed to their own lives. You know, the brain has a wonderful way of adapting to its environment, and children who are deaf, they adapt tremendously so. But if there's a person who's never experienced someone who's deaf, it's hard to imagine how that child's brain will adapt. But if you've had that experience, you understand the possibilities, and we see those possibilities at Gallaudet and that mindset. But without that experience, how do we give more information to people who are hearing so that they look at this experience of people who are deaf and understand what it's like for a person's brain to adapt and for them to be successful? So these are the conversations that we need to have to really work to improving and continue to expand the ideas over time. You were inaugurated as president a few months before another president will be inaugurated, Donald Trump. How has the Gallaudet community reacted to his election and what are your hopes or concerns about what his presidency, presidency might mean for Gallaudet or for deaf rights? Well, first off, I actually spent time with the students the night of the election. Originally, they asked me to be there to speak to them at the very beginning of the evening as the election's results were just beginning to come in, and I decided to stay the evening, and I spent the night with them. And, you know, what we witnessed together was democracy in action. And I spent the evening again with the students talking with them about we are a country of laws and we need to educate ourselves about what's happening within the system. And I can see, you know, some of the students who were, you know, this is the results they wanted to see and many other students who did not support the results. However, for us, by the end of the evening together, I was very proud about how the students were beginning to pick up and calculate electoral votes and trying to figure out what was happening. Of course, the motions were running, running quite high. But by the end of the night, a number of college students were down at the White House and they were protesting. And our students were all talking about the possibility of joining them at the White House, but many decided not to. And it's because of the conversations that we had, and those conversations were around, are you clear what it is that you really want? Do you understand what happened in this election? What were people actually voting for? And what were they voting against? Do we really understand that? And have we committed ourselves to understanding what we could do together as a community to truly listen and engage with each other and to start dialogues, which, by the way, we held the next day. We held two forums on campus the next day based on the experience of the night before, engaging in dialogues to understand multiple points of view. And the challenge for many deaf students is that, you know, when Donald Trump belittled people with disabilities, it caused an emotional reaction. Emotions ran high because they were concerned about how people with disabilities would be viewed by this administration. Now for others, for others, people who were deaf, they saw a man who was a businessman who's going to create jobs. And, you know, we have a conflict in terms of objectives here. We want to work, we want to have good jobs, and at the same time we saw behaviors that didn't seem, well, they weren't consistent with how we view ourselves. So our challenge, our challenge first is to make sure that we understand each other on campus, that we're able to hold space for one another to truly understand all perspectives and the complexity of what's happening right now in the world around us, here in the United States, as well as on our campus at Gallaudet. You know, we, we only have about 30 ourselves. seconds left. 
Oh, yes. Yes. So we owe it to ourselves to have these dialogues. And that's the commitment that we've made to ourselves and one another within our community to deepen our understanding of our next steps and what our opportunities are to work with this administration, Congress, and really the nation to continue to improve the lives of all people in America, not just our own communities. Roberto Thank Cordano you. is the president of Gallaudet University. Thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to the interpreters who facilitated by translating her comments made in American Sign Language into English. Thank you both for joining us. And that's it for the show today. If you're getting ready to head over the river and through the woods to Grandmother's house for the Thanksgiving holiday, we've got the perfect holiday travel companion to suggest the show. If you've missed recent episodes, catch up while you travel and never fall behind again by subscribing to the podcast. Just search for Kojo Show on whatever service you use and be sure to meet us back here tomorrow at noon. We'll speak to the director of a play now at Theater J, where a pastor questions one of his faith's core beliefs and divides his congregation. More than a dozen local choirs are performing in this production. That's coming up tomorrow at noon. Until then, thank you all for listening. I'm Kojo Namdi. The Kojo Nomdi Show is produced by Michael Martinez, Ingalisa Shrobsdorf, Taylor Burney, Elizabeth Weinstein, Ruth Tam, and Avery Kleinman. The engineer is Meg Bunting. Podcasts of all shows and audio archives are available at our website, kojoshow.org.